History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 16. On the interpretation, or on interpretation, the concept of progress, um, part two. January 14th, 1965. We had started to explore the debates about the nature of progress, and I took the opportunity to make a brief digression on the subject of the mentality that always responds to everything. How should I describe it? By saying that's not possible, with the intention of thwarting the discussion of serious matters, by resorting to the tactic of disputing that a concept has a recognizable referent, by denying the existence of the object denoted by the concept. If I have let fall a few scathing remarks about the concept of synthesis, you will be able to see from my comments on this phenomenon that synthesis can be quite a ticklish business. On the one hand, the universal dominance of synthesis, that is to say, the attempt to supply, to identify, to cobble together a concept for everything, is highly problematic. On the other hand, if you attempt to deny a concept any substantive meaning and endeavor to reduce it simply to what it happens to cover, then this will no more lead to knowledge than will the practice of dissolving everything that exists into pure identity with its own concept to the point where, in the last analysis, the concept contains no more than itself. I believe that if you picture these two poles for yourself, that is to say, on the one hand, the self-sufficient absolute concept, and on the other, the absolutely empty concept which is no longer capable of grasping anything at all, you will come to see the sort of predicament philosophy has fallen into, a predicament that means that it must not surrender either to ontology or to positivism but must regard these twin schools of thought as interrelated, and that no doubt doubt is what common sense tells us is meant by the term dialectics. I would say that if we apply the term progress all too pedantically, that is to say if we look too closely at the word, we will find ourselves cheated of of what it promises, namely of its answer to our doubts and hopes about whether things will ever improve, and whether human beings will ever be able to breathe a sigh of relief. I believe that you should start by taking progress to mean this very simple thing, that it would be better if people had no cause to fear, if there were no impending catastrophe on the horizon. If you do this, it will not provide a timeless absolute definition of progress, but it will give the idea a concrete form. For progress today really does mean simply the prevention and avoidance of total catastrophe. And I would say that if only it can be prevented and avoided, uh, that would in fact be progress. If only for this reason, we cannot say with any precision what we should understand by progress. It is because an aspect of the present crisis is that everyone feels what I have just tried to explain to you while the words that would break the spell are missing. In other words, we can find nothing in reality that might help to redeem the promise inherent in the word progress. Oops. This absence of a concrete, immediately obvious potential is what makes it so difficult to answer the question whether or not progress is possible. The only reflections about progress that have any truth are those that both immerse themselves in the idea and yet maintain a distance from it standing back from the paralyzing facts and specialized meanings that prevent us from understanding what actually is intended. Today, as I have already remarked, all these reflections come to a head in the question of whether mankind whether mankind will succeed in preventing a catastrophe. Humanity's survival is threatened by the forms of its own global social constitution, unless humanity's own global subject becomes sufficiently self-aware to come to its rescue, after all. The possibility of progress, of averting the most extreme total calamity, has migrated to this global social subject alone. And I have no need to tell you that what I mean by this global subject of mankind is not simply an all-embracing terrestrial organization, but a human race that possesses genuine control of its own destiny right down to the concrete details, and is thus able to fend off the unseeing blows of nature. On the contrary, the mania for organization, be it for an enlarged League of Nations or for some other global organization of all mankind, might easily fall into the category of things that prevent us from achieving what all men long for, 
instead of promoting that cause. To repeat, the possibility of progress, the avoidance of total catastrophe has migrated to such a real, not merely formal, global social subject. Everything else involving progress would have to crystallize around it. Material want, which long seemed to mock progress, has been potentially eliminated. Thanks to the current state of the technical forces of production, no one should need to suffer privation any longer. Given the current state of technical development, the fact that there are still countless millions who suffer hunger and want to be attributed to the forms of social production, the relations of production, not to the intrinsic difficulty of... And... Okay. Um, Not to the intrinsic difficulty of meeting people's material needs. This is particularly... This has particular force when we consider the possibilities of a truly rational organization of agriculture throughout the world. Whether there will be further want and oppression, the two things are identical. Humanity must and will, certainly will, continue to be oppressed until the question of material needs has been resolved. will be decided solely by the avoidance of a calamity through the rational organization of society as a whole, in a manner befitting humanity. Kant's sketch of a theory of progress, too, was anchored in what he called the idea of man, a quote from his idea for universal history with a cosmopolitan purpose. The highest purpose of nature, i.e. the development of all natural capacities, can be fulfilled for mankind only in society. And nature intends that man should accomplish this, and indeed all his appointed ends, by his own efforts. This purpose can be fulfilled only in a society which is not only the greatest freedom and therefore a continual antagonism among its members, but also the most precise specification and preservation of the limits of this freedom in order that it can coexist with the freedom of others. The highest task which nature has set for mankind must therefore be that that of establishing a society in which freedom under external laws would be combined to the greatest possible extent with irresistible force in other words, of establishing a perfectly just civil constitution. For only through the solution and fulfillment of this task can nature accomplish its other intentions with our species. Thus, the concept of progress is linked to that of a fulfilled humanity, and it is not to be had for less. I would draw your attention in passing to a problem that arises here, namely Kant's use of the term nature, Obviously, nature here is not intended in the sense of nature as constituted. In other words, nature as it is seen in the objects of the natural sciences. Nature here involves something for which there is not really any space in the official edifice of the Kantian critiques, not even in the critique of judgment. What I have in mind is a, is a teleological idea of man whose disposition disposition is such that what he really is, is something that he is first to become. This concept of human nature is neither a basic anthropological given in Kant, nor is it identical with the constitutum, const, constitutum nature of man, as a thing among things, but it is a concept that must, and I hope will, soon be energetically worked out. But all of this is simply by way of elucidating the direct impact of Rousseau on this question. The concept of history which has space for progress is emphatic. It is the universal or cosmopolitan concept that appears in Kant, not a concept concerned with particular life spheres. The dependence of progress on totality, the fact that progress exists only if mankind as a whole can be said to progress, and not if it represents progress in particular spheres of life, turns against progress itself in so far as it concerns humanity itself. An awareness of this animates Benjamin's polemic against the coupling of progress and humanity in his theses on the concept of history. Perhaps the weightiest criticism of the idea of progress held by those in crude political terms may be included among the progressives. For those of you who have taken a particular interest in Benjamin's philosophy, I should say in general that, from a relatively early stage, one of its underlying motifs was Benjamin's attempt to differentiate himself from Kant, Benjamin had been deeply impressed by Kant, and it is clear that he is striving to distance himself from a thinker who impressed him and appeared very powerful, but was also, I should like to add, something of a threat. Benjamin does not make this act of separation explicit or articulate, 
or, or articulate it in philosophical terms. But it is one of the themes underlying his thought that we must be aware of if we are to understand him. Almost all his writings, at least his mature writings, are influenced by the fact not that he disputes the crucial Kantian concepts, but that he passes them over in silence, that he fails to mention them explicitly. The passage from Benjamin I have in mind is as follows. Progress as pictured in the minds of the social democrats was, first of all, progress of humankind itself, and not just advances in human skills and knowledge. In order to understand this passage properly, you must be aware of the context in which it was written. It goes without saying that he does not believe that progress is to be sought in advances in human skills and knowledge, rather than in humanity itself. But what he ascribes to politically reformist attitudes is in fact, if I may extrapolate from his statement, the view that they, namely superficial middle-of-the-road thinkers, have equated this particular progress in skills and knowledge. In other words, progress in technology in the broadest sense, or as Horkheimer and I have called it, progress in the domination of nature with progress itself. Whereas the truth is that particular advances in the techniques of domination contain the potential for the very opposite of the progress that I set out to describe at the beginning of this lecture. Just as mankind tell Kell does not progress in line with the advertising slogan of better and better that Benjamin criticizes in the increasingly superficial propaganda of the workers' movement of the period between 1870 and Hitler, so too there can be no idea of progress without the idea of humanity. In Benjamin, progress derives its legitimation from the theory that the idea of the happiness of unborn generations, without which we cannot speak of progress, inevitably includes the idea of redemption. He thus confirms that the idea of progress is inseparable from the survival of the species. No progress may be supposed that implies that humanity already existed and could therefore be assumed to continue to progress. Rather, progress would be the establishment of humanity in the first place, the prospect of which opens up in the face of its extinction. It follows, as Benjamin continues, that the concept of universal history, which we have discussed at some length, cannot be salvaged. That idea was plausible only as long as we could believe in the illusion of an already existing humanity, coherent in itself and moving upwards in a unified manner. <coughs> if humanity remains trapped by the totality it itself creates, then, as Kafka observed, no prog progress has taken place at all. While mere totality, the idea of totality, allows progress to be entertained in thought. This dialectical moment in the concept of humanity as a totality can best be clarified by the definition of mankind as that which excludes absolutely nothing. If humanity were a totality then no long, that no longer contained any limiting principle, it would be free from the coercion that subjects all its members to such a principle. It would thereby, thereby cease to be a totality so that it might finally become a totality. It would cease to be an imposed unity. The passage from Schiller's Ode to Joy, if my memory serves me right, contains the lines, and he who knows nothing of this, let him steal away, weeping out of this company. In the name of an all-encompassing love, it banishes anyone to whom such love has not been vouchsafed. The poem involuntarily admits the truth about the bourgeois conception of humanity, at once totalitarian in particular. In these lines, what the one who is unloved or incapable of love undergoes in the name of the idea of humanity unmasks that idea with the same affirmative violence with which Beethoven's music hammers at home. By using the word steal, the poem joins in the humiliation of the man who is joyless and who is therefore refused joy for a second time. It is scarcely a coincidence that associations from the realms of property and crime should be evoked in this way. As in totalitarian political systems, a constant antagonism forms part of the concept of totality. This is how evil mythic festivals are, de are defined in fairy tales by the guests who have not been invited. The principle of totality sets limits, even if it be only the commandment to resemble itself. Only if that principle were to disappear would humanity and not its mirage come into being. Oh, God damn it. Sorry, my phone is being a cocksucker. 
Historically, the conception of humanity was already implicit in the theorem of the universal state proposed by the middle Stoa. Objectively, at least, this amounted to an idea of progress, alien though it may have been to pre-Christian antiquity, which was dominated by cyclical ideas of history, as indeed were the Stoics. The fact that this tenet of Stoic philosophy also served to buttress Rome's imperialist ambitions tells us something of the impact on the concept of progress, of its identification with human skills and knowledge. The existing generation of people is substituted for those as yet unborn. History is turned directly into soteriology. That was the prototype of the idea of progress, right down to and including Hegel and Marx. In St. In Saint Augustine's Civitus Dei, this idea of progress is still linked to redemption by Christ as the historically successful redemption. Only a mankind that has already been redeemed can be seen once it had been chosen and by virtue of the grace that had been vouchsafed it, as if it were moving within the continuum of time towards the kingdom of heaven. It was perhaps unfortunate that later thought about progress should have inherited from St. Augustine an imminent teleology and the conception of humanity as the subject of all progress. You all know about the links between him and Kant, and theref thereafter between Kant and later secular theories of progress, while Christian soteriology, in other words, the science of salvation, the doctrine of salvation, gradually faded away in a welter of speculations about the philosophy of history. In this way, the idea of progress was completely absorbed into the civitus terena, its Augustinian counterpart. Even in Kantian dualism, this civitus terena was supposed to progress in accordance with its own principle, in accordance with its nature. Such enlightenment places human progress in the hands of humanity itself, and so concretizes progress as an ideal to be realized. However, within it still lurks the conformist confirmation of existence as it is. This receives the aura of redemption, even though redemption failed to occur and evil persisted unabated. From the standpoint of the philosophy of history, such a modification of progress, with all its incalculable consequences, was unavoidable. Just as the emphatic claim of successful redemption turned into a protest in the face of post-Christian history, so, conversely, the Augustinian doctrine of an imminent movement of the human species towards a blessed state contained the motif of irresistible secularization. The temporal nature of progress, its simple concept for progressing is simply inconceivable outside time, binds it to the empirical world. Without such a temporal dimension, in other words, without the hope that things might improve with time, the heinous Aspects of the world and its ways really would become immortalized in thought, and creation itself would be turned into the work of a Gnostic demon. In Augustine, we can discern the inner constellation of the ideas of progress, redemption, and the imminent course of history, ideas that risk mutual destruction if they are allowed to dissolve into one another. If progress is equated with, rede with redemption as the transcendental intervention par excellence, then it forfeits, along with its temporal dimension, all intelligible meaning and evaporates into ahistorical theology. However, if progress is channeled into history, this threatens to convert history itself into an object of idolatry, and with this, both in the reflection of the concept and in reality, we are faced with the absurdity that it is progress itself that inhibits progress. Expedients such as a concept of progress that is both imminent and transcendent, such as the one produced by the late Siegfried Mark, condemn themselves by their very nomenclature. The greatness of the Augustinian theory was that of its originality at the time. It contains all the abysses that beset the idea of progress and strives to provide theoretical solutions for them. The structure of his doctrine brings out the antinomian nature of progress without attempting to soften it. In his teaching, as also later on at the, at the climax of secular philosophy, philosophy of history since Kant, and above all, therefore, in Hegel, conflict is placed at the heart of the historical movement that is thought of as progress, because it is a movement directed towards the kingdom of heaven. For Augustine, this movement is 
is the struggle between heaven and earth. Every subsequent idea of progress has derived its profundity from the mounting burden of historical calamity. Whereas in Augustine, redemption was the telos of history, the latter does not lead directly to the former, to redemption, nor is redemption the direct consequence of history. Redemption is embedded in history by the divine plan of the universe, but has been at odds with it since the fall. Both things hold good then. Augustine saw that neither redemption nor history can exist without the other, nor can they exist in each other. They are suspended in a tension whose accumulated energy ultimately aims at the transcendence of the historical world itself. In the age of catastrophe, the idea of progress cannot be conceived of as settling for less. Progress should no more be ontologized, unthinkingly ascribed to the realm of being, than should decline, with which, admittedly, modern philosophy appears to be more comfortable. Too, too little that is good has power in the world for the world to be said to have achieved progress. But there can be no good, not even a trace of it, without progress. If, in accordance with a mystical doctrine, worldly events, right down to the most insignificant occurrences, are to have momentous consequences for the life of the absolute itself, then something similar may be claimed for progress. Every single element in the web of delusion is never less of relevance to the possible demise of that web of delusion. The good is what struggles free, finds a language, and opens its eyes. As something that struggles free, goodness is part of the texture of history, which, without being unambiguously set on reconciliation in the course of its movement, illuminates the possibility of reconciliation in a momentary flash. According to conventional thinking, the features in which the concept of progress has its life are partly philosophical, partly social in nature. Without society, the idea of progress would be quite vacuous. All its features are abstracted from society. If society had not advanced from a horde of hunters and gatherers to agriculture, from slavery to the formal freedom of the subject, from the fear of demons to reason, from want to the discovery of ways with which to ward off epidemics and famine, and to the improvement of living conditions in general, if, in short, the idea of progress had been kept philosophically pure, if it had been spun out from the nature of time, it would have had no content at all. But once the meaning of a concept compels a move into the realm of facts, of historical reality, this necessary transition cannot be halted arbitrarily. The idea of reconciliation itself, the transcendent telos of all progress, cannot be freed from the imminent process of enlightenment, which banishes fear, and by erecting mankind as the answer to the questions posed by man, it reaps the concept of humanity, which alone rises above the imminent state of the world. For all that, progress is not tantamount to society. It is not identical with society. Indeed, given the nature of society, progress may at times even be its opposite. As long as, as philosophy was at all useful, it was also a theory of society. However, by surrendering without demur to its power, it is reduced to rhetoric to assert its independence. The purity, Hegel speaks of the revolting purity, into which philosophy relap relapsed is the bad conscience of its own impurity, its complicity with the world. The concept of progress is philosophical in the sense that it articulates the movement of society as a whole at the same time as it contradicts it. Having arisen from within society, progress calls for a critical confrontation with society as it actually exists. The element of redemption it contains, no matter how secularized, is indestructible. The fact that it can be reduced neither to actual reality nor to ideas points to its own contradictory nature. For the element of enlightenment in the concept, the impulse towards demythologization, which by assuaging the terrors of nature ends up in reconciliation with it, is twinned with the element of the domination of nature. The model of progress, even if transposed into the Godhead itself, represents the control of nature, both inner human nature and nature outside man. The oppression practiced by such control and mirrored in the mind and the identity principle of reason reproduces this antagonism. The more identity is postulated by the spirit that dominates, the more injustice is meted out to the non-identical. Injustice is passed down to the non-identical, feeding its resistance. 
This resistance in turn reinforces the principle of oppression, while at the same time, poisoned by oppression, the oppressed limp on. Everything advances within the whole, only the whole itself fails to progress, or at least has failed to progress up to now. Goeth's in all urgency, all conflict, is eternal rest in God the Lord, codifies this experience. And Hegel's doctrine of the development of the world's spirit, the absolute dynamic, as a returning into itself, or even a game with itself, comes very close to Goeth's apoth apothgem? Apothem? Apothem. I don't know. We need add only one footnote to their summation, the fact that this totality is motionless, and its motion, because it knows of nothing beyond itself, does not mean that it is the divine absolute, but rather its opposite, rendered unrecognizable by thought. If I were to finish on a theological note, I would have to call it hell. Kant neither acquiesced in this deception, nor did he make an absolute of the rupture. In the most sublime passage in his philosophy of history, he taught that antagonism, the entanglement of progress in myth, and the hold of nature on the domination of nature itself, in short, in the kingdom of unfreedom, tends to move by virtue of its own law towards the kingdom of freedom. Subsequently, this insight formed the basis of Hegel's cunning of reason. But if that is the case, then it means nothing. Less than that, the possibility of reconciliation is rooted in its own contradiction. That the precondition of freedom is the unfreedom that precedes it. Kant's doctrine stands at a watershed. It conceptualizes the idea of reconciliation as intrinsic to the antagonistic development, since he derives it from a design that nature is said to have conceived for man. On the other hand, the dogmatically rationalist inflexibility with which such a design is ascribed to nature, as if nature were not included in this development, and as if its own concept would not be modified by it, is the mark of the violence that spirit inflicts upon nature in its desire to postulate identity. The static quality of the concept of nature is a function of the dynamic concept of reason. The more reason appropriates elements of the non-identical, the more nature is reduced to a residual caput mortem, and that is what makes it easy to furnish nature with the qualities of eternity that justify its ends. The very idea of design can only be conceived if we allow that reason can be ascribed to nature itself. Even in the metaphysical use that Kant makes of the concept of nature at this point, and which brings it close to the transcend transcendent thing in itself, nature remains the product of spirit, much as it does in the critique of pure reason. If spirit vanquished nature by following Bacon's program and making itself the equal of nature at every stage, then at the Kantian stage it projected itself back onto a nature which is conceived as absolute and not merely constituted. It has performed this act of backward projection in the service of a possible reconciliation in which the primacy of the subject is to be preserved undiminished. At the point where Kant comes closest to the concept of reconciliation, namely in his assertion that antagonism culminates in its abolition, we find the key phrase about a society in which freedom is said to be combined with irresistible force. But even this talk of force reminds us of the dialectic of progress itself. If a sustained oppression continually arrested the progress that it had unleashed, it was also, as the emancipation of consciousness, the first to recognize the fact of antagonism and the totality of delusion, a recognition which was the prerequisite for overcoming all conflict. The progress engendered by eternal sameness is that at last, at long last, progress can begin. At any moment, if the image of an advancing humanity reminds us of a giant who, after sleeping from time immemorial, slowly bestirs himself and then storms forth, trampling down everything that gets in his way. His rude awakening is the only potential for maturity. By maturity, I mean... By maturity, I mean that the imprisonment within nature, in which progress itself is implicated, does not have the last word. For simply eons, it made no sense to inquire about progress. The question became meaningful only after the liberation of the dynamic from which the idea of freedom could be extrapolated. Ever since St. Augustine, progress has meant transferring to the species as a whole the idea of the natural course of life of the individual between birth and death. If progress is as much a myth as the idea of the path fate has ordained for the constellations, 
The idea of progress itself is the anti-mythological idea par excellence. It disrupts the circle of which it formed a part. Thus, progress means escaping from the magic spell, including the spell of progress that, it, it's, that is itself nature. This happens when human beings become conscious of their own naturalness and call a halt to their own domination of nature, a domination by means of which nature's own domination is perpetuated. In this sense, we might say that progress occurs where it comes to an end. I should like to break off at this point. <laughs>